I hope in the future I can meet you guys wherever in the world, obviously, too. Well, you say that now, but... Let's <laughs> yeah, well, let, let's just get, get this recording, this episode back first, and, and see, your, see how you feel after that. Yeah. Welcome to the Flick Lab. I'm Karri. My co-host is Henrik. Most importantly, our guest is Nesar Andari. Welcome to the show. Pleasure, pleasure to be here, uh, Karri and Henrik. I'm really honored to be part of your uh, podcast and show and uh, excited to talk about cinema, always. We are very grateful to have you here tonight. How, how would you yourself pronounce your name? Uh, it's Nizar Andari. The, the last name has a little bit, uh, you know, a ah sound, but Anderi, Nizar Anderi, yeah. Yeah. So you are a scholar and a filmmaker based in Abu Dhabi. Yes. You have written the book titled The Cinema of Muhammad Malas, and you have done some short films, I understand, and uh, you have a feature film. Yes. Um, uh, I am a uh, professor. Uh, my PhD was in comparative literature. And I really have been studying many forms of culture, uh, literature, theater, cinema, since I was a graduate student in the United States. And uh, I grew up all over the world, in the Arab world, and also in the United States, too. I also have been fortunate to have done a couple of plays and films I produce here uh, for Arab film studio short documentaries. and. Uh, the film that I made on the filmmaker Mohammed Malas, one of the pioneer auteurs in Arab cinema uh, in Syria, from Syria, it's entitled Unlocking Doors of Cinema. That was my first feature. Um, hopefully not my last feature, but it was my first one, yeah. So you are originally from which country? I have two passports. I'm proud of them both. Well, I don't know if I'm proud of them both. I take that back. <laughs> um, I don't want to be proud, actually, of that. But I'm, yeah. um, I'm proud of my parents. I, I, I have a Lebanese passport and, and a U.S. passport. Um, I guess what I meant by being proud is that, you know, yeah. I don't need to talk yeah. about the governments, but uh, got it. My parents, my background. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with that at this point. Yeah. We. Karri and Henrik, we are from Finland. We have studied media. I finished my studies in 2010 and Henrik is currently studying in the University of Lapland. And he's going to be a Master of Arts. What do we do here? We nowadays tackle bi-weekly some directors or some overall themes for a couple of hours for your listening pleasure. We like to dive deep into certain director or it could be an actor as we have discussed uh, Steven Seagal lately and so we're all over the map. We have of course our beautiful so-called Finnish rally accent to cheer you up here. Hopefully you can uh, you can uh, handle that and uh, what we do here normally is that we discuss uh, the director first and give you some kind of a introductions on the people who worked on the films and then we look at some kind of overall themes from those films, some that might even connect between the different films. And then we end with our quickie section, where we kind of mention what, what were our, our personal highlights in the different films. Okay, but to continue... That, of course, yeah. may not entirely apply today, because our, our guest is is an academic and a professor who has researched the subject extensively. So most likely today may be more more of an interview and more of a discussion be, be, between you know me, me Kari and Nisar than, than than our typical typical show. Yeah, of course, but uh, we have watched this film, so I believe it would be interesting also for our guest tonight to hear what were our personal highlights or what we found most interesting, perhaps, from our perspective. 
Yeah, well, that's a Campbell that you are gonna take, and you are also the one who will not be seen off after the recording. <laughs> <laughs> but before we start, I I guess we would have to drop a couple of of disclaimers for for our Western listeners. That the first one is that uh, today, uh, through through the films. That we are gonna cover, we are going to be talking about Syria, as a as a, as a country and as a nationality, and well, in in the Western media, Syria has been covered extensively through the the most recent conflict, and that's the perhaps the the first point that I I wanna address here is that uh, Syria is is a lot of things. The Arab world is is a lot of things other than, than the most recent conflict or the, even even the Arab Spring, which is something that we try to emphasize today. And this is something that, that for example, in Finland, you can forget quite easily. The, the most recent one, yeah, the, the Syrian civil war has been going on for, has it been like a, like a decade mm. already? Right. Yeah. Me, meaning that in, in Finnish school system, there are, there are kids... Who are now leaving their, their first first level of schooling? They are enter, entering the second one, and they have never even existed in a world where where this current conflict wouldn't be ongoing. So we wanna emphasize that that Syria is is something else than what you see in the news today, and that ties ties to the second disclaimer, which ties back to the films that we have done previously. Uh, this isn't the first time that we are talking about films that come from a region that has had a recent conflict going on. No. The, these previous two would be the, the Bosnian War films, Pretty, Village, Pretty Flame and No Man's Land. Something to, to note before we start. Uh, anyone who has listened to those episodes already knows that, that when we talked about Pretty Village and No Man's Land, we talked extensively about the conflict, the, the Bosnian War. What happened, mm. how it happened, why it happened, and what may be the, the consequences that, e- even the future con- consequences that we still are waiting to play out. Our today's lineup, today we are looking more at the director, Muhammad Malas, and, and a set number of films from his, his filmography. Our lineup consists, more specifically, we are talking about the films Gunnator, 74, uh, Dreams of the City, The Dream, The Night, Passion, and also the, the two documentaries, uh, Unlocking Doors of Cinema and Ombres et Lumière. So timeline wise, what we are covering today is something like from seventy four to two thousand five. So unlike in in Pretty Village and No Man's Land, where the films were specifically about Bosnian Bosnian War, today's film lineup specifically is not about Arab Spring or or, or the the mo- current Syrian conflict, and therefore the. Once in our uh, our listenership who are fans of cheap spectacle and enjoy and read some macabre ple- pleasure from the act that me and Gary land up on a political minefield and have to somehow worm our way through it, today we are not going to be addressing Arab Spring or Syrian conflict, uh, at least not in extensive way. It, since this is a free-flowing conversa- conversation, those topics may, of course, creep up, but the films are not about those subject matters, and we will not, we don't make any effort to precisely to aim the discussion so that we would be, we would find ourselves talking about those matters. Yeah, I'd like to add to that disclaimer, if I can. Um, I think it's a, it's a great point. Um, because, I mean, Molas' last film was called Ladder to Damascus, which was about the, the Syrian revolution or civil war or nightmare. People have many words for it. We haven't really even decided what 
uh, Syria in the last 10 years is. Uh, but I, I'd like to emphasize that Malas himself and the, the issues of his films, what's ironic is that they haven't left us. Refugees bombing indiscriminately, schools being turned to, to rubble, all the issues that you see in, in his films, really, for me, on some level, are a lead up to the catastrophe of what happened in Syria after 2011, when you have over half a million people dead, vanished, so on and so forth for, I mean, in, in a horrific way. Um, and so I think um, when we watch these historic Syrian filmmakers or Lebanese or Palestinians, th there's so much echoing of what we have uh, going on in today's Arab world too. So yes, it's not directly connected. It doesn't give the answers about who Bashar al-Assad is or who the government is or what did the United States do wrong or Obama or Trump or those current things in the newspapers, but it gives a deeper um, crisis. Um, it reveals deeper crises in the plural in those societies. And I think that's it's worthy of looking at all of those early films of Malas and other many, many great Syrian directors. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to his latest film, The Letters no, of Damascus. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, well, that would have been interesting to look at. But at the same breath, I've heard that it's possibly not uh, some of his best work. Yes, some people, you know, just like uh, well-known auteurs from Jean-Luc Godard to uh, Woody Allen or Tarkovsky, whatever you like, you know, everybody has their favorites or what they think is good or bad. And you're right about many people did not think it was his best work. Um, that's true. What is your connection with uh, Syria, um, actually? So have you spent also, you said that you have lived all over the Arab world. Does that include Syria? Yes, yes. I, um, well, I first went to Syria um, twice, escaping Lebanon in 1982, when there was uh, an Israeli uh, destruction of Lebanon bombing in, in June, beginning June 6, 1982. I was a very young kid, and uh, we had to escape Lebanon uh, via Syria, so we stayed there for a while. I, again, had gone, in order to get into Lebanon throughout the war, we would have to go through Syria. Um, I had an aunt who was in Syria, so uh, the borders between Lebanon and Syria and Palestine, I just want to remind people, are, are quite, for, for many of us, quite fake from my grandfather's generation to, to my own generation. It just doesn't really make sense, these nation states that were created. I don't know if it's, you know, it's, it's I don't, sometimes people like to c compare it to the Balkans, but I'm not sure. I, I, I think that the nation states of, of, that have been created, are, are, the borders are quite fake. But yes, I, then after I left the Arab world, I had lived in Egypt and Saudi Arabia too, I went back and I studied um, uh, theater and Arabic literature in Syria. And one of the classes that I took was in, in, in 1995, 96, I took a class in um, the Russian Cultural Center with Mohammed Malas on cinema as an art form. And I was studying Arabic literature, improving my, like getting a higher level of Arabic because I had just gone and, and did my, my degree in the United States. Um, and so I was very fortunate to be introduced to cinema from, from this famous uh, director. And that was my first meeting with Mohammed Malas. Uh, he was my professor. Oh, that's such a luck. And w would you consider Mohammed Malas as the most favorite uh, cinematic art creator from Syria? Um, I'm not someone who believes in saying most favorite. I mean, you know, it, those of you may be more familiar with uh, French cinema. Do you prefer Truffaut or Godard? Maybe you like Vaut or Chabrol or Romain. I mean, with Syrian cinema, there are many great ones. However, for me, Malas, Amir Alai, Nabil Mal, there's many that I like from that generation. I think there's something about that generation 
of Malas, I would say, and Malas is part of this amazing generation of young men and women that really were pioneers of, of, of cinematic language for the Arab world, and I, I mean, I would say for the world also. But uh, uh, so I, I definitely Malas, I think as a young man, when I first saw his film, it was liberating because it, it allowed you to see that cinema could be more of a language and not an industry. Same thing, I mean, I hear this from my professors in the U.S. universities about when they first watched a Godard film in the 60s or uh, Agnes Varda, if you prefer her, and stuff like that. So, I mean, for me, Malas and, and some of these other directors were quite liberating because they showed many new ways of... of, of of what cinema could be. And they themselves, Melissa's story, um, his education in cinema came from an amazing cinema school in Moscow. He, he went to school with Osman Sambe, with the great directors of West Africa, of Algeria, there was even uh, Lebanese, and many, many, many great directors actually were educated in, in Moscow in the 60s and 70s. So it's fair to say that you're interest in Muhammad Malas started from this course and uh, even prompted you to, to write the book later on. Yes, that, that, connection, that connection made it clear that he was someone who did not get enough attention because in general when we study Arab cinema, even in Finland, I think when courses are taught on Arab cinema, the main focus will be, and correctly so, will be on Egyptian cinema. Uh, for instance, on another auteur who I've written about, the focus will be on Yusuf Shaheen or early Egyptian cinema. Um, and, uh, and that's not a mistake. It's, it, it is the most, uh, uh, the, the most highly distributed Arab cinema in the world is Egyptian cinema. So that's why it's, it's the more well-known cinema in Europe and, uh, the, and Scandinavia probably and the rest of the world. Yeah. And of course, when it comes to Quinetra, which is featured in several of his uh, Muhammad Malas's films, this is uh, his home city. Do you have any personal connection with Quinetra? Uh, that's a great question. Um, first of all, Quinetra is like a mystical place for Muhammad Malas. It's it's something that he lost that he can never get. It's a reminder of all the tragedies of the Arab world. It was a stopping point for many of the people that went to Palestine, many of the people that came from Palestine. It was a central point that witnessed battles between European armies in World War I and World War II. The Ottomans built an important garrison there, the Ottoman Empire that was in control of the region for over 300 to 400 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was the first stop even for um, a, 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 a Circassians. I don't know if you know that culture. They're, in, they were, they, they're actually in Russia and Bulgaria, but they, there are many Circassians in Syria and Jordan right now because they found a home in places like Qunaitra. And so Qunaitra for him is this midpoint between um, many things, and it was his home. It's where he watched his first film. It's where, um, uh, you know, it, it, m many things about Ponetra were quite important for him. But unfortunately, it was overtaken by Israeli forces in 1967 and superficially recovered by Syria after the war of 1973 and then retaken again by Israeli forces in 1974. And when they gave it back partially, they left it virtually an uninhabitable place. It was razed to the ground. And so when they withdrew, they blew up like half of the city almost. And so even when he went back, it was impossible to live there. And so Koneta really, for him, when you speak to him, it's like everything I do is about Koneta Nizar. That's what he would tell me, right? Everything goes back to that spiritual place of mind. And it's, it's almost crazy because it's true. I mean, he always can connect something back to an image or an idea uh, connected to his family and Qunaitra and the loss of it. So he himself is a refugee 
who grew up in Damascus uh, because of having to flee from Qunaitra, either from economic reasons and then, and then also because of war. So Qunaitra has probably been shapeshifted so many times that it's nothing like that it's appearing in his films even today. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you you can see if you watch my film, I put a a a, a very strong image of a car being hung upside down, um, and it, it, the the utter destruction that happened there was was quite a tragedy. Yeah, would would there be something that you would like to give us a like a general biography of Muhammad Malas? Yes, he's he's born uh, d- during the period of the forties. In, a, in an Arab world that wanted to see itself as united, um, wanted to not be controlled by European forces, by European boundaries, by, you know, Winston Churchill smoking a cigar with cognac, deciding a couple of things, those type of things. They wanted to be free of that. But at the same time, it, it was a it was a world that had always been cosmopolitan. The the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. There there had always been Europeans and Indians and and Russians coming in. Um, the, it it was always a mix of cultures. I would say too, when we look back historically at Syria. So he's he's being born into a world that is has always been cosmopolitan on many levels, even in the smaller towns like Qunaitra, I would argue. And so um, he gets educated, and 1948 is a massive deal for all Arabs that live next to um, Palestine, or what is now called the State of Israel. And uh, that totally changed many things for many people, because whole geographies were changed um, because of that. And he, many I would say, like my father's generation, Hamid Mullahs, were all influenced by the creation of the State of Israel and its destructive sense in the region for, for many people. And so he grows up, he gets educated in a Syria that's trying to become itself. Syria, by the way, for those of you wanting to study more about Syria, was known in the 50s, if you would read the gossip papers, you know, you don't have to become so serious historian, it would be, oh, that's the country that has a hundred coup d'etats, right? Because it seemed like every single couple months there was a coup d'etat, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you you know, from Husni Zaim to Shishak to all these characters, it was was crazy. It was hard to even follow Syrian politics. Um, And so he also grew up in a very volatile state because these states like Syria and Lebanon were quite new in and of themselves, right? The people, their experiences are ancient, of course, but the state was new. And, of course, they became uh, part of, you know, the the Cold War. He was, uh, of course, we, we can't ignore this. Where did he get a scholarship to get educated? He was a teacher, and he was actually teaching in Syria. And... He got a scholarship to study cinema. He, he was actually wanting to be a novelist. He was an intellectual. And to this day, Mohammed Malas doesn't see himself as simply a filmmaker. No, he's an intellectual. He's a writer. He writes novels. He writes books, memoirs, and he's a filmmaker. And so he gets this scholarship to go to Moscow. And from there, he develops this poetic, cinematic voice that um, he's able to really develop into one of the strongest voices in the Arab world in the 70s and 80s, I would say. And just as important, him and two other Syrian directors, Omar Amir Alai and another one, they created cinema clubs that went all over Syria, showing Syrian citizens and Syrians films like Haile Jarima, the Ethiopian director, showing Truffaut film, Francois Truffaut, the French director, Showing them world cinema, showing them Solanas. I don't know if you know that director from Argentina who who did Hours of the Furnaces. Really sort of educating them in revolutionary auteur cinema from many, many cultures. And so you meet some younger Syrians in the 80s. They were all educated by the cinema club that Malas and his 
other well-known directors created in Syria. So I think that part of his biography should never be ignored, what he actually did as a public intellectual in Syria. You know, you, you have a Syrian state that from 1970 was always oppressive. It's the same state that controls Syria to this day, the Ba'ath state, controlled by a political party called the Ba'ath political party. And so, and that's why I was responding to Henrik in the beginning, because the same anger that Malas had in 1974 when he tried to get his second film out or his third film out or the films that were erased by the government is the same anger that the young Syrian filmmakers had in 2011 um, mm. because it was a state that was highly controlling um, and they had to really manipulate everything in order to get their films out. So Malas, if you look at his distributors as he became more prolific and more famous in the world, he starts getting money and co-distribution from Europe, from France, et cetera, et cetera. From his last film, Ladder Damascus, was with Lebanon, when, the one that showed in Toronto Film Festival. And so um, I think that's an important part of his, his bibliography, that he was always knocking on doors and trying to open them up uh, for, 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 not just for filmmakers, but for novelists, for this, for that. It's, it's quite a, a well-connected world. When you're a, a filmmaker in Syria and Lebanon or Palestine, you're also part of a group of intellectuals that really were pushing the limits of, of the state, I would say, uh, many times. And uh, not always, but many times. And so, and to bring it to today, well, he is a Syrian, like many Syrians, who has been in prison, who has suffered, but he has insisted to live in Syria. He's insisted to be there because that's, you know, he, he could have left. But he has kept his voice, even though, you know, it, it's not easy to, uh, to, to make films in Syria. He's still trying to get money to do his films. And he's approaching his 80s right now, he could, 78, 79. Could there be in any way said what would be the, the regular Syrian's view on his filmography? I would imagine that this, this, many of these subjects that he is tackling with could be seen as dangerous or something that maybe the state would not like to come out. Yeah, I mean, not everyone is going to like his films. Some people find it too poetic or too auteurish, not um, too elliptical. Right? So we use the word in cinema, elliptical, when the filmmaker goes back and forth in time and narrative um, and not always inconclusive. There's ambivalence in his cinema sometimes. It's not clear. Um, and so not everyone prefers the cinema of Muhammad Malas, but everyone, when you watch a Muhammad Malas film, you, there, there is always going to be or there was, nowadays we're in such a different world in terms of our taste, but his poetic sensibility of, of the frame, of mise-en-scene, of sound editing, of music, um, is second to none. And his mix as a director between documentary and fiction and hybrid and experimental cinema is also quite, when you, looking back in history, is quite singular too. Um, but the average Syrian, for instance, I have a Syrian friend I play sports with in Abu Dhabi. I didn't know him before. I said, yeah, I made a film on Muhammad Malas. He said, oh, wow, Muhammad Malas, he's one of our great filmmakers. So the average Syrian recognizes that he's one of the great Syrian filmmakers. Um, mm -hmm. They might not like him, just like, you know, not every Finnish um, yeah, person likes Aki Kuramaski. Kura, Kura yeah, not, it doesn't mean everyone, but everyone recognizes that he's one of the big names. Yeah, and indeed, it's it looks like when we spend time in Quinetra, it seems that there's a lot of great care is given to all the cinematography, the way it's made to look and sound. Very beautiful night shots in the night, especially. Is there anything about the cinematographers that you would like to highlight? I think I'll just go back to Malas. He he worked with many cinematographers. His first famous film, Dreams of the City, 
which was considered to be the top 10 in Arab cinema throughout the last 100 years, he worked with a well-known Turkish cinematographer. Um, in Khunetra 74, I, I'm forgetting the name of the, of, of the cinematographer, but he was very much influenced um, by third world cinematography coming from Latin America and uh, this revolutionary cinema. And you can see that with the, with the use of the camera almost in, in like catching reality and questioning the camera in the opening sequences. Um, but that's the opening sequences of the film. As it, as it progresses, it becomes dreamier mm. and more internal um, about accessing something that was lost. And the cinema itself, the, 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 um, the, what Malus would say is that what he would work with his cinematographers to create not a dreamlike state, but a memory like state. And he says, I am the filmmaker of um, memory and loss. That's an, he calls himself a filmmaker of memory and how to um, translate memory into scenes, right? Um, and so I think Conetro 74, the scene with the, the girl jumping rope to the chicken to the, the you know, sleeping on on the tiles of this destroyed house and trying to clean the broken windows. Mm. Um, it, it's really a mixture of, of, of the framing and, and the lighting um, is all about recreating um, a sense of loss there. Yeah. Something that I found kind of interesting in, in Malasa's films when, when I watched more than one of them was that uh, much like Malas himself, who is a who is a cosmopolitan person, also his his cinematography is, is at, at least in my opinion, quite cosmopolitan in in the way how he uh, how he kind of shoots his films. Like uh, in in Quinetra seventy four, I I saw a lot of French new wave and, for example, uh, Algerian French cinema like like Z. The movie right. Z, I I saw a lot of similarities, kind of kind of like like how 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 the how the cinematography talked to uh, talked to me. Like for example, in in that tracking shot, as as the lady is, is running, yes, yes, exactly uh, through, through the street. That was to me very much like French New Wave, Algerian French movies. The night to me spoke. Mm, strongly on the level of Soviet cinema, especially the the dream sequences that that movie had with the with the wall collapsing. Right. And Passion, on the other hand, I would almost describe as his most Western movie from the punch that we wa we watched, which consisted films from from Quinetra seventy four to Passion. I would say Passion was cinematography wise perhaps most open most to to a western audiences kind of most easier for uh, as an as an western film goer mm. for me to kind of understand visually wise yeah sure definitely yeah no I, i'm always interesting how people react to all of his films i think you're right in um in in, in those influences um I mean, I think it's a mix of influences that he had be be between Russian cinema and not just, I mean, when I met with him and started studying him more and also, I also realized how much I didn't know about Russian cinema and how much, I mean, we study some of the greats like the Soviet cinema Tarkovsky, but there were so many other uh, filmmakers that had influenced him that I, I myself am not an expert on. Um, and... Um, uh, but I think you're right. Passion, well, it's interesting. Passion, there's a lot longer story to it. It's also, it was co produced by a French company. And it was maybe the beginning of Malas doing a film that did not connect to his own autobiography. It was, if you watched my film, you'll notice that he found the story in a newspaper, right? Um, 
And so passion itself comes from uh, an, another, another creative impulse to sort of also mourn uh, this encroaching problems in, um, I, I would call it global society, between an ex extreme fundamentalism, right, uh, uh, that, that is, not, it's not just about Islam, it's, it's a very um, parochial way of, of looking at the world, and also how the state itself supports uh, this narrow-mindedness. And, I mean, notice I'm not connecting this in any way, and Malas doesn't really either, to a one religion or something like that. It's not just about Islam. I mean, his, his larger anger, even in passion, is not at the backwardness. It's actually at, uh, of, of Islam, actually. He's not criticizing Islam. He's actually criticizing the state itself. Yeah, coming back to French Algerian film productions, you could maybe even see a little bit of influences from the Battle of Algiers uh, from Gil upon the Tsarvo. Uh, 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 also, I would say he was really influenced by Burn, the second film by Ponte Curvo, um, what showed in Syria and Lebanon all over the place. And that, if you watch the opening of Burn, Burn the way that sort of the, the blood spills on the screen and it it, it's like the, the, the camera becomes like a gun. Um, I mean, all those, I think that period of the French New Wave, it, especially post-67, 68, there's a confluence between Latin American cinema, French New Wave, Algeria. I mean, it's, uh, it's the beginning of, I mean, some people call it a post-colonial consciousness. Um, it's, it's when the French themselves started really understanding perhaps the, 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 the legacy of colonialism. Uh, some people would say that only Michel Haneke's film Caché <laughs> uh, or, or some recent films in the last 10 years actually are bringing this out even more. Um, but that's, that's another story. If we would look uh, at these films one by one in a little bit more detail, starting with uh, Cunetra 74, which I believe is also just called with the name Memory, in some parts. Uh, who is uh, Wedat Nasev? Ah, 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 Wedat Nasev. That's his second film, and that's called Memory, and it's a beautiful creative documentary about a woman who is quite intriguing. She didn't leave Konetra. She stayed there, if you watch the film closely, with her 20 million cats. Um, many cats, I exaggerate, of course. She didn't have 20 million. She had a lot of cats in the scene. But um, she, I think, is, is representative of how the maps for people kept on changing. She couldn't, you know, at one point it was, she had to go inside of Palestine, then back to Lebanon, then there, then there, then there. Constant state of movement and inability to be grounded. And then finally she decided, no, I'm just going to stay here no matter what. Um, she, her brother wants to take her to... Uh, to, to go to America, we see in those scenes with the letter, um, and yet it's this film, I think, that um, it showed Melissa's ability to do like portrait documentary on another level, right? There's a, there's a moment when she's existing in her memory and she's playing with her hair, with her brush, very poignant scene, very beautiful choices of what to film. I use it when I teach people documentary, I, I, I use that film actually. Um, to show different types of shots you can make to reveal character and to anxiety also. Yeah, it was uh, beautifully shot and an interesting, interesting con concept of the bunch. It runs for about... And you don't know how hard those films were to actually make. I mean, many of Molesse's films are completely gone, vanished, yeah. burned. And uh, that film, just to get it out, I think 75, 76, I forget the exact date when it came out. It, 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 it took a lot of effort from him, a lot of, uh, you know, it wasn't easy the, uh, those days to, to, to be able to work with an editor and to finish the film, to get it approved, not easy at all. Is it all the audio that is overdubbed uh, until the, the night from 1992? So technical limitations or or some kind of a style approach 
Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're right because of the, uh, there, there's a lot of reason for the dubbing and for the voiceover, um, and that that's one of you know synchronous sound is such a is a luxury also in cinema, but it's also you know you can even look at filmmakers like Chris Marker, the the Sans Soleil or whatever, very experimental, who was also influential to Malus um, later on. Uh, using voiceover or dubbing in, in different ways too um, as, a, as a creative technique also as sort of playing around with time I think uh, that's how they were using it what are actually the films that were lost forever is do we have a complete list of all the lost films lost films um, well I can uh, talk about one uh, for sure, there's others, but it, it would entail a, a longer conversations. But um, mm. th there, there, there's one film that was on the Euphrates that was an environmental film, and it, it originally he had to pitch it to the government that he was looking at folklore, but he was re looking at the desalination of certain areas of Syria and the abuse of the land, and he was connecting this to the music, and for me. This type of environmental, I don't want to say activism, because that's a miss, people in, in, in the West will misunderstand. I, I would say it's, it's a higher environmental consciousness of how to do, um, it, how to express um, the degradation of the environment and how to express this issue that we're all confronting right now, which is climate change. And that film, because it was critical of the government, was completely not allowed to come out. It was burned, and all he had was a couple pictures of um, that he got from a moviola, and that's what I put in my film. Um, and that film, really, I mean, it's a shame because it wasn't. Again, it was for me. It's also important because I'm also a director of an environmental film festival. Um, we tend to see many dogmatic films about the environment, like you should do this, you shouldn't do that. And those are the ones that don't convince people. But it's the ones that connect to culture, to life, to, to who we are, that are ambivalent a little bit about, about our relationship to nature, which is not black and white, which isn't clear. And Malas seemed to have been wanting to do that kind of film at the time. And so that was quite inspiring for me. Another film, he, he did a film on early pre-Islamic Arabia, um, it was shot in Sharjah, it was finished, I've seen the whole film, but it cannot be shared. Um, uh, another film uh, uh, was actually a very creative one about uh, Palestine and Tunisia. As you know, the Palestinian leadership after they were kicked out of Lebanon in the 1982 war, when I also escaped from Lebanon, was also based in Tunisia and he had a project there and due to certain political issues and personal artistic ego uh, never came out either. So those are three that I can mention right here and when you meet with him and have you know long six-hour conversations you're you're blown away by oh I have uh, two or three scripts on this I have a script on for instance, he has a long script that he was developing on the Qaramita of Bahrain that were an, a, now, a communist Islamic movement in the 10th century. Now, I'm just using those two terms to sort of, they were an Islamic movement that believed in social egalitarianism. Um, and him and his friends wanted to make a point that Islam can work together with a type of social egalitarianism um, more. From those three lost films, the, the last one you mentioned, I'm guessing it's it's the In Search of Ada. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you know what actually is, is the reason behind the banning of, of that film? Like I understood, understood that Euphrates was banned because of its environmental messaging. It was the film that was blamed for being too cynical by the, by the government. And the second one of these, the, the Cradle, uh, which it, at least 
according to my understanding, it was banned because it tackled the the inner schism inside the Kindath tribe. But I I never managed to figure out or, or find out why In Search of Ada was was being banned. Was it really just too much for for the censors that that film was showing that Tunisian intellectuals were caring of the Palestinian cause, or like, was that really the reason? Or is there is there something in Ada that that it got banned so heavily? I I actually don't think that it got banned in the end because of censorship, or that it even got banned. Actually, I think the real reason he was working with a well known. Tunisian um, director and actress and uh, uh, and I, I think in the end it, it the film didn't finish because of um, some disagreements um, and that's something probably more to the truth than the idea that it was banning or too much for the Tunisian government um, than uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a story as much as the Euphrates one as censorship or being critical of the government. It appears that after Quinetra, several years later, the director conducted interviews with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon during the civil war. And this was to become the documentary The Dream from 1987, of, of course. The interviews themselves were conducted between 1980 and 1981, before this massacre in Sabra and Shatila. Yeah. And uh, the director had to take a a bit of a break from the material, I understand, and then concentrate on something else, which was Dreams of the City. Yes. Um, well, he, he starts work on it after... Uh, he had to take a break because of Dreams of the City and different things, but also because of the war itself. You know, he visited the camps in 1980-81, had hours of footage, but again, like the date that I told you about my life, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon was quite a traumatic event for the region. Mm. And uh, in that event, you also had the destruction of thousands of Palestinian films. Uh, that one of the things that the Israelis bombed was uh, the Palestinian Film Library, which is such a it's a it's a, a terrible loss actually. Um, but fortunate for us, Malas did keep his footage mm -hmm. and did keep a memoir. He has a book on this uh, that is uh, was translated by the co-writer uh, Samir Al Qasim, who worked with me um, on the book um, and. Um, it, it's quite amazing, this film, because, you know, many of the people that he befriended when he was doing the interviews, they were massacred. But he returned to the footage and, uh, you know, the, the massacre was in 1982 and he returned to the footage in 1987 and cut down 400 interviews to 45 minutes, to 23 dreams. I'm, I'm just being specific. Um, and he also... You know, there, the, you not only can watch the film, but you can read the book. And I, I was very fortunate to, uh, yeah, to be able to read both and to uh, to really see the amount of effort he did as an interviewer, um, as, as a documentary form, was quite amazing. I mean, he would spend days um, just hanging out with the family. Um, and I think that's quite noble because in today's world, when you teach documentary, or when you see a lot of document, they feel they can just go into a place for 30 days and just come out with a feature film sometimes. And I think his school and many schools in Eastern Europe, I would say, really see that the great documentary form is taking years to make. Um, but uh, yeah, perhaps those days are over. Huh. I feel that in many of his uh, films that this uh, documentary type of approach raises its head. For for example, now in Dreams of the City, uh, where we basically follow this uh, widow called Hayat, and uh, she's forced to be moved with uh, the two children, Deep and Omar. 
to re- right. to reside with the father in Damascus. However, I think I f- get this feeling that this film is very much kind of following the historical events events that happen around the characters, not so much focusing on the characters as much as the history. Yeah, it's it's the, the characters are embedded in history and they're they're part of the historical moment. Um, sometimes it looks, I mean, it, it could look like caricature caricaturesque, but it's also, I think, he did have a good talent of filming Deeb. His relationship to Deeb is quite amazing, how he filmed him, how he found him, um, and he's an image that you see to this day all over Syria. He's, he's become a little bit of an icon of of childhood innocence. Um, and, you know, but he puts Deeb in, in, in the year between 1953 and 1954, in Syria when uh, a general was, General El Shishetli was deposed by Faisal al Atasi, And again, to go back to our part of the, the, you know, the podcast is that Syria in the 50s had coup d'etat after coup d'etat after coup d'etat. And Malas actually sees this period a couple of years as almost liberating because at least for him, there were voices of many political parties. And he tries to show that in Dreams of the City. He tries to show these debates between different people and the encroaching oppressiveness of, of, of a cer- certain form of government that he feels destroyed um, Syria and stuff like that. Um, How is the, the level of access to these films during the release? Was Dreams of the City still accessible in... Uh let's say Europe, the United States? I don't think it's been that accessible. I don't think Molas has been seen that much. Um, I think there is a distributor in, in Europe, uh, Mech Films. Molas's films showed in the United States in 93 and 94 for the first time, which is 10 years after it was shown at Cannes Film Festival. I, I don't know what that means. I think that's some, that at that time it was normal. Now we have the we have different expectations, but I, I would say now it's you, you know you have you know there are certain websites for Soviet cinema where you can access like the Soviet Union. I I, I taught this film because I love the novel Don Quixote. I don't know if you guys know it mm-hmm. by Cervantes, and so I'm able to go find the Soviet recreation of Cervantes, a film in the 60s. But with Arab cinema. Really, it's a terrible. It's terrible. It's it's you have to beg and find and get lucky to get these films, right? Um, it, it's it's almost impossible. And it was such a difficult thing for me as a filmmaker to access the best cuts, the ones that I could use in the edit room that were consistent. Even the director Mark Cousins criticized me, saying, "Listen." He didn't criticize me, but he says, listen, this one is not the, the way it was filmed. And I said, that's right, because that's the only copy that's left of, of the film. And so the the state of distribution in, in Arab cinema, especially the ones done pre-2000s, is, is, is terrible, actually, is, is, is really a weakness, I would say. And I, I hope, um, you know, Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Fund that has restored classics like The Mummy by the great Egyptian filmmaker Shadi Abdus Salam, which is considered the Citizen Kane of Arab cinema. Those of you that think Citizen Kane is the number one film in history, I'm sort of joking, but serious too. Um, that was restored by the World Cinema Fund. And I think really restoration, it someone has to step up and really create um, more restoration of Arab cinema before it just gets all lost. Like the Euphrates film, you know, but for reasons even just because of negligence. Yeah, and as a Finn, I feel that uh, even if the film Dreams of the City would have garnered wide release in cinemas all over the, all over the world, still there is, uh, at least now, I don't know how in the 80s and uh, how Syria was how much it was depicted in Arabic culture in any outlets of any kind, but there is a pretty huge uh, cultural gap that you really have to understand a lot of terminology and 
people's names and um, understand the, the the history. The yeah, I mean, culture. I think you're, I think you're you're right about that. There is uh, you really have to be. I think for Melissa's films, I mean, I think Henrik said it that yes, he's cosmopolitan. Or I don't know which one of you said it. It's true, but there is something I want to say noble about Melus in the sense that his films are really part of the world that he's from without making the film for the world. Now you would see with the new generations, even myself included, we're, we're already locked in a world where we speak three or four languages when we, our audiences is this so-called global audience that we're talking to, even in this podcast. I mean, who am I talking to? Um, and so uh, Malas himself is not like that. He's very much comfortable with his own milieu. <clears throat> and, and I think that's what's beautiful about watching his cinema is that, yes, you cannot access everything. It's not accessible. You shouldn't, I shouldn't go watch a finished film and be able to identify with it 100%. That would be a failure for me. Of, of, but that's what's becoming with Netflix. Now on Netflix, uh, it's happened to me. Oh, let me watch this Finnish film or this Czech series. I watch it. It's like any other series, but, you know, a, a similar style, but it's in a different language. Um, I think what's great about these earlier periods in the 70s and 80s in Arab cinema is that they're, they're, it was not always accessible. Um, and that's what made cinema beautiful. Like you would actually go and watch an Ethiopian film that you couldn't understand all the moves of the director or a Senegalese filmmaker like Osman Samben or Tuki Boki or, you know, this is when you study world cinema, this is what's beautiful is when you, you cannot actually understand all the moves and all the cinematic language. When you see that cinematic language is not what you thought it was. And I think that was one of the lessons early lessons for me when I first watched Molas. Where, whereas now many companies and countries that contribute something to Netflix or these, these wide libraries of films, they pander to the international audience in a way that may, maybe my film will be successful, so I will make it as accessible and easy to munch on as I can possibly do. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and, and the film festival world, unfortunately, is, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a big question for our age. Are film festivals going to come back and be very strong? Um, I hope so. I hope that the theatrical feel of cinema, the, the interactive, what I'm doing with you guys right now, this, this, this element that cinema is part of a discussion of what it means to be a human, um, in different places at different times, not always universalizing, but also showing difference. This, this way of doing that with audiences, with discussions, I hope it comes back. But now, I mean, obviously, in this COVID era, it's a little bit different for all of us. So, Right. So again, I, I do kind of feel that that's also a change in the attitudes of filmmakers or how, how the directors themselves see themselves. Like in in your book and in the documentary, Malas makes repeatedly the the point that what he tries to do is is create memories. When when he talked about Quenetra seventy four, he mentioned that he wasn't trying to make a document. He wasn't really trying even to make a film that that kind of looks what Quenetra is now. He was trying to make a memory of 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 a place that he once knew. And I, I, to me, when you when you talk about contrasting Malas's filmography to the what what you have in Netflix, this is some uh, kind of a, a personal connection between the di- director and his material that I I kind of see in in Malas that perhaps the directors of today don't no longer have because Malas he like you said he he sees himself self as a creator of of a memory and right. memories are always personal you, you you can try to share your memory with someone else you can try to talk about your memory to i i can try to to talk about my memories to Kari, but they will always be my memories they will always be extremely personal right right no i i think that's a brilliant point that's a big difference i think but i i guess the question i would ask you henrik or ask the world why is this? Are we more fearful of 
expressing our own personal memories in a cinematic way. I'm sure there are filmmakers that are doing this still, um, but do we watch them as much? Do they become the well-known filmmakers? Um, I mean, I think, but this is what's called, some people will still call it auteur cinema, who are very, like Agnes Varda. You know, she just died, I think, what, two years ago? The great French New Wave filmmaker. Some people call her the mother of the French New Wave. You know, the director of Clio, um, the director of uh, so many great do documentaries, Les, Les Glaneuses. Um, the, I don't know if you know, The, the Gleaners. That's a, one of the most important, for me, one of the most important French documentaries um, uh, of all time. But I, I think this personal intellectual poetic filmmaking yeah it's 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 most filmmakers are not wanting to do films for those reasons perhaps it's per, I, but i don't know you know what how to is is that a good thing is that a bad thing do we incur, do we encourage this do, do the film schools in finland encourage this type of filmmaking or do they encourage different types of filmmaking uh do they you know, I, I see film schools these days sometimes not encouraging experimental filmmaking, but then other film schools only encouraging experimental filmmaking. And I think we need to be encouraging all, all styles. Um, I know I digressed from your point about Melissa Netflix, but it, I think, Henrik, it's, you're bringing up... I mean, these are big issues for all of us today in, in, uh, as students of media and cinema. Uh, me as a professor, also me as a filmmaker. It's, it's, it's big questions about what we do and why we do it. Yeah, and uh, since, since you proposed the question why that is, um, to kind of throw, throw my two cents in, uh, yes, uh, in, in, into I, the I, question, I, I kind of see that, or I believe that is, is a joint problem of, of many different factors. Uh, the, the marketability and the sellability of, of of film, of course, is is one factor at play here. Uh, today, movies cost quite a lot. You you have to to push them into the market. There's there's a, like a a sea of cinema, and you somehow have have to be seen. So you have to be accepted by Netflix. You have to somehow get into the market that is kind of becoming more and more manufactured. Mm. Every year, uh, part of the problem, in my opinion, is is film schools and what is being thought in in film schools, and more more than that, and more than any kind of a specific aspect. Like, I I don't believe that film schools, for example, in Finland, are teaching its students how to become directors who get on Netflix. But what they are being te te what they are teaching is that you will become a director, you will become a, si a cinematographer, you will become the dude who you will become a scriptwriter, you will become the dude who is who is in charge of the lighting, right. and we don't have this this kind of well jack of all trade intellectuals like Malas has. You you point out that he is he's a novelist and, right. and he's a teacher and and he's a filmmaker and he understands cinematography and in in my opinion in film school curriculum we no longer have like, like that 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 range we we have people who who study how to become directors but they don't study how to become scriptwriters or how to become novelists how to become philosophers we we make right. directors and the final problem that i i kind of see at play here is is a certain lack of courage that is not tied into the the monetary incentive like like the need to be on netflix but more, kind of a lack of more lack of more personal courage like it, when you when you really try to to do like like Malas does, when you try to create a memory, that that's a as mentioned that's a that's a personal thing. So 
when you create a memory, when when you create something that is about you, that is of you, and you show it to the world, you kind of expose yourself in extremely intimate matter, and you open yourself for a backlash in a very intimate level. Someone may say that that this this film that you poured your heart and soul into and into which you took material from your own past traumatic e- events it's not good you you are a bad director and this this is a bad film and it's not only about pandering to cer- certain themes or um it's maybe even hard to select the kind of uh, subject that would get made because in in Finland it's the real challenge of getting funding for your film from the government uh, which seems to be extremely important in getting your film anywhere. Uh, That is in in Finland you have to more and more fund your movies by yourself if if you are someone who kind of wants to do something kind of out of the box or out of the norm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's sort of interesting that Malas actually was supported by his governments in the beginning, and they, they like the Iranian cinema, they use the government in in a subversive way. Like, the, the, there's a famous Iranian film, like, about, it's called Persian Cats, or who knew something about Persian Cats? Bahman Robadi, he's one in Khan. But he would tell the Iranian government he's doing a film about an apartment block, but then he would be doing it about, you know, rap music in Iran um, <laughs> or hip hop music. So he, he was quite creative and Malas the same way. Um, and they maybe they they had to have that conviction and lack of or, or, or well, there's a there's a, a Hebrew, a Yiddish word that's nice to use, chutzpah, right? Um, they had to have this extra courage or, or daringness to to do it and i think they did and but henrik i think you're right about this idea of film schools and separating uh, divisions uh separating the director from the cinematographer from the writer to the thinker and seeing cinema as like all these separate fields and um i think that's hurt cinema on some level i don't know i heard you know, I'm not an expert on every film school in the world, but I know there's a film school in Poland, uh, Uch yeah. Film School, that makes the cinematographers direct, makes them paint a painting, um, makes them, and that's why supposedly the Polish cinematographers are the most well known in Hollywood too. I think uh, I, I don't know all the names of, of cinematographers. My my cinematographer, who I worked with, knows all of them. Um, he actually was educated in Uch. The, the, the person who shot my film um, is a, like uh, educated at Uch Film School. But completely different Uch to the film schools that I encountered in the United States or the UK or anywhere in the world or what's trying to be set up here in the UAE. I'm constantly impressed by the cinematographers from Poland, and many of them are working for indeed some of the top names in 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 Hollywood. And just recently, when we took an in-depth look into Jan Komasa, the director from Poland, and uh, yes, it's great, great stuff. And uh, yeah, that that's what we say now. But just wait two years, and Komasa too will be directing for Netflix. <laughs> well, we're kind of waiting for that moment now. <laughs> I have to admit. It'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we could look a little bit on uh, Passion from 2005. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, this is, some. I would say, the most easiest to, to watch for people from, from Europe or the US or so-called Western uh, world, where we have uh, now like a pretty traditional storytelling woman who struggles to well, I guess it exists under the pressures of the society, or at least these particular fellows. Right. Yes, I mean, uh, it, 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 is a tra- it, it is a traditional story. It's a tragedy par excellence of, of Iman, who is a young woman uh, who married out of love, uh, who, who loves singing old Arabic songs, especially 
the songs of Umm Kalsum. And Umm Kalsum is, is uh, the diva of, of the Arab world and from, the, from the 40s even um, and 50s. He's the diva of Muhammad's young, Muhammad Malas's world. He's, um, to this day, there are actually two or three films on Umm Kalsum that you, you should both watch. And one of them was done by a well-known Iranian director. Um, and a fiction film on Umm Kalsum. And another one is a more documentary film by Virginia Danielson. And so Malas, you know, he, he saw a newspaper incident about a woman who was killed because of her passion for singing. And so he created the script here. But the trick for Malas is, like you saw in my film, he, and he says it out loud. He goes, I want, the Europeans wanted me to do a film on honor killing because they're always fascinated um, by there's a stereotype oh the Arab world treats their women badly let's see that or mm. it goes back when you look at Rudolf Valentino films the sheikh you know oh the Arab man you know will kidnap the woman and rapes and I mean it's, it's a stereotype of the other for Europe and he said no I don't want to do a film on honor killing because this is something stereotypical and it's 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 not fair. I mean, many Arab intellectuals know that one out of three American women are raped by their husbands, right? It, the, 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 the violence against women is all over the world. Um, and yet there's a fascination. There's, I think, too many films about honor killing in the Arab world that are funded by, by, by people. But that's, that's, that's regardless of the matter. He really wanted to do, he really felt the film that he wanted to do in Passion was a strong critique of the state and how it led people to be divided, to be silly, to be parochial, to kill about like a stupid song. And so he blames the state for the increased Islamic fundamentalism. And that's one of the points that comes out in Passion, I think. And it's also for many people at the time and for Malas, he felt that he created some romantic scenes that were quite beautiful um, and quite courageous on, on the screen. Obviously for, you know, uh, I don't know how courageous, I mean, I think when it came out, it wasn't, you know, I think it came out 2003, 2004, or five. right now looking back. Um, but he felt that he was quite creative in how he filmed the love relationship um, and uh, many other things, yeah. Do you think it's, or is it, this particular song or songs that could uh, create such of a reaction from from the society towards women, or is it something that is an issue about singing? Yeah, I think it's, it's, I, I, I think it it was a larger metaphor that that the state and its manipulation of religion has killed. If you look at the last words of the movie. Mm -hmm. You've killed the, 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 the young person who is, um, I don't, he's a, 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 he has a disability, let's say, or he has, a, he, he's maybe autistic or something like that, yeah. Um, yeah. let's say, he, he screams out loud saying, you've killed the song, you've killed the song. Right. Malas is trying to say that the state with its uber, with its surveillance, with its pushing people um, into poverty, with it, with its not allowing people to have certain experiences. Remember, um, her brother, or th they're all connected by someone who's in prison that she cannot communicate with, right? Mm -hmm. Iman, the main character. And that's the hidden trauma of the film that many people don't focus on. But yet, it is the focus of the film because that is what made the fa fundamental uncle, the person who kills her, right, go crazy also, right? That is what controlled the whole family because one of the relatives was a revolutionary. And so, I mean, Malas is saying that, the, that Syria at that point failed its promise to its people and they killed the song. They even, this society has killed the will to sing even. And so it's, it, it, it's quite an, a real strong critique of, of, of what the Syrian government and the Syrian state did. 
And that's why to respond again to Henrik, yes, uh, these earlier films are not directly about the Arab Spring, but he would argue, and I would argue, when you watch them, this is some of the reasons, not all, of why the Arab Spring happened. Because the states uh, continuously killed the song. Um, now, we, we, you know, Malas is interpreting this on a, an emotional level, on a level of, of humans and families and stuff like that. Um, but uh, that, that is the strong emotion of these films. And when you watch it with other Syrians, many people com com uh, compared, you know, Bab al-Maqam to the whole Arab world, that our song has been killed, right? We've been strangled. And so it did, like, it did hit a chord, Bab al-Maqam in the Arab world. It's, it's not his most famous film, but to be honest with you, Kari, I think what's interesting is that when I when it's screened, um, it, it creates a very powerful effect in people, and I think that's interesting. I think perhaps in, in twenty years, when someone else writes a book on Malas, this might be the film they focus on. Um, yeah, it's possible, at least for the way that you can most easily jump into this film. I, I don't know about, of course, uh, the twenty thirteen thirteen film uh, letter to Damascus, but. Uh, is that creating the similar kind of story building as, as passion? Um, no, Letter to Damascus is, is again, that's why probably what, well, it got into Toronto Film Festival, it got into many film festivals, but in terms of accessibility, uh, it was an essay film. It, it put uh, a young group of young Syrians in one house, all trying to cope with with a civil war that was beyond them, beyond their control. And it, it, it really is a, a cry for Damascus, for Syria to, to achieve itself. And, and it's Melissa's first film about the generation that he was not and saying that, you know, when you watch my film, I mean, he realizes that his generation really made some mistakes. They didn't take it all the way. They, they made compromises with the government sometimes. Um, and the new generation wouldn't. Um, and so you have to watch that film, but it ends in a way that's uncompromising. The young people of Damascus take the ladder and they take it somewhere you wouldn't believe. But I won't tell you where. You have to watch it. Um, <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll be able to watch it someday. It is indeed very hard to get access to these films. Yes, it is. We'll see. Henrik, do you have any... Uh, overall thoughts of, of, the, of the films that you would still like to share or the structure uh, I can let you start with with your uh, with, with by basically the, the coding line that you found from these films and and well I don't know quotation marks structural analysis <laughs> by the way I did notice the the repeating theme or that you have in Queen Hetra 74, those broken broken glasses and broken windows. And this is uh, something that we yes. see again in dreams of the of the city. So, yeah, I got this feeling that this is the expanded edition of of memory. Yes, and you see in, in all of his films a reflection of water. You see broken glasses again. You see... Sh you see, you, you see yeah. I mean, some people would say a cinema of fragmentation. You see... Um, both image and, and, and Henrik, you mentioned it, the, the, the building collapsing. You, you see things collapsing always in his films, um, things breaking down. And, and that's a repeated, uh, you know, the, the, the film philosopher Deleuze would call it a cinematic idea that happens over and over again. Um, and, it's, it, and it's a sense of collapse. It's, I mean, when you go into film theories, people start using psychoanalysis and all these things like, even Zizek, the way he, Slavov Zizek, the way he analyzes Hitchcock, but I don't know if we need to go in that direction, so. Mm. I kind of found a lot of connecting tissue be between between the, the selected filmography that we went through, and perhaps the, the, the most striking elements to me was this uh, I, I kind of found this this conversation between the director and the audience, uh, especially since since these films so heavily 
kind of rely on the concept of memory and these movies being a pieces of memories. And I kind of found this one in, in more in, in Malas's documentary style. And especially in 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 his documentary uh, documentary that the dream and the the ombres at, at Lumiere, where oh, I I kind of kind kind of saw this attempt to to immortalize a moment in time, certain persons in in that moment, like in the dream, you you have the refugees who, as as the film at the end points out are now gone, perhaps all of them, perhaps forever, as they have been massacred. And in in Ambres at the Lumiere, you have the aging director who was the was the, who directed I for the life of me can't remember the name of the film, but the, the first Syrian Lebanese feature. And what what he yes, talks sir. about is is his inventions, and how, right. Nazir, and his name is how, Nazir Shah Bender, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you a lot for that. And he he talks about his inventions and how he basically still wants to to kind of try to repair his inventions, make make them better, and he still is taking care of them, and and he reminisces how. Once he dies, his kids will most likely just, just sell them or, or throw them away. And you're, you're looking at this old man who, who is almost blind and he's with shaking hands, he's trying to... He's trying to invent the 3D camera. He's trying to create a 3D camera, actually. Um, and that's an amazing film that Malas did with his two other... Syrian directors that's again he did it as a group effort a collectivity of directors that's another thing you don't see anymore um, but I think Henrik you did you know bring out something you, you used the word I liked it um, immortalize um, even if you watch the night there are these moments where it sort of stops a character looks in the screen um, it's sort of slow a dance between father and mother, a glance between father and son. Um, he's trying to make us remember or f want to remember too. Um, and that, that repeats in all of his films, even I would say in, in Passion, um, it, it, it slows things down. It goes, there's these sort of cinematic techniques of 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 uh, like of of playing around with uh, like looking through a keyhole or looking, uh, seeing her re recording um, through the sky. Um, all these are attempts to hold on to uh, something that's been lost um, in in life, and so it is a type of immortalization in, in his cinema always that he's always trying to hold on to something because there's such a a psychological sense perhaps that. We, we that I've lost so many things that we can't recapture it. That you know, this ability to listen to Um Kalsum to the singer is gone because it's become because our societies are becoming more conservative, right? We've allowed the conservative element to have more power. Um, I mean, you, you see this in many states, it's not just the Arab world, you see this in France with Le Pen, you see this with the US with Trump. I mean, you see. Uh, types of conservatism, like getting rid of uh, certain cultures and stuff like that. It's different, but I think Molas is also um, trying to immortalize uh, these these things. So, um, and you see that in all of his films. That's true. I mean, another thing, Kari. I mean, is is there one thing that you can tie structurally to all of his films? That's a big task. Um, but it. But in, in making a film about Malas and having to be with him for, you know, a long period of, of straight time and, and actually him getting angry at me for making a film about him sometimes because it was quite a difficult process. Um, I also learned that in the end, I mean, it, sometimes talent or he, he's able, his, each mise-en-scene of Malas 
is for him a sacred moment. So I'll give an example in my film. The last, the last um, two minutes of the film and the last minute of my film, he insisted that I spray water all over the ground to give it a different texture. And uh, I had shot that place before and he was right. It gave it such a more uh, grounded texture. And I think that, you know, in, in looking back at all of his films, it's as a director, I mean, he really taught me patience. I mean, he actually on set um, would always want to discuss with me, um, okay, what's, what's this color? How, where am I going to sit? Why am I sitting here? Let's go over this. And it was such a great learning experience because he really, every single time there's a scene to shoot, like it's a sacred moment for him. And that's just, uh, you know, for someone that's also had to teach documentary and you have to get people through and you have to, you know, time is money and you need to do this. Um, it was just such a different way of living cinema. And I know that we're supposed to focus on Syria, but I also think that just as a filmmaker, as a way of filming, um, it was a poetic way of making a film with him also. Um, and that's how I think he makes films too. I mean, he told me even in his script writing, he never followed the script writing, you know, where you learn final, you get the software and you do it. Um, he always writes his films out like a mix between prose and poetry. And he usually has like 50 to 60 pages of that that he uses and then he converts it more into uh, the traditional script with, uh, with different people. What? struck me very very strongly when I was, was watching your documentary was exactly how hard Mala seemed to be towards himself. Like there, there were some really... I, I found some really self-condemning statements that he made. Like, like for example, example, the one that you already mentioned, when, when he makes the case that, that he, his generation and with him, with it also he himself failed in so many ways and how they were not aware at any point of, of the realities or in, in Syria for over 400 years and how he kind of puts his hopes on the next generation. Yeah, no, I think you're, that was very powerful, but also very, you know, you meet with so many other people that are not self-critical, that are not willing to give an inch or, or give, a, or at least criticize themselves. And it was very refreshing to, you know, to be able to meet with a director who actually, you know, he also, in between, he, he criticized some of the films. He goes, no, ladder, this film, I wanted to do it this way, and I couldn't have done that. And in search of Aida, I mean, he talked, actually now it's coming back to me, the memory of that. I mean, he... He had so many dreams and he was critical that he didn't create a better relationship with Jalila Bakar, who was a Tunisian, um, also a director, actor. Um, and so um, I, I found that refreshing about him, that he, he was self-critical. He was able to, you know, not be arrogant. <laughs> and I think, I know that sounds simplistic, but not being arrogant is, 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 is such an important quality these days. Um, and I, 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 I kind of feel that that is also a quality that is missing in, in a lot of, for example, West. That's true. I mean, for sure. I mean, and, uh, there's an arrogance. We, I mean, but I wonder if our societies in the West or the universities create an arrogance too. We, we are trained to think that we have to be arrogant. We have to be overconfident. We have to... You know, um, I mean, I'm teaching even young uh, Arab Emirati students who are, you know, the culture of Instagram and Snapchat and uh, these things. And uh, th there is this culture that you have to be confident, that you have to not be self-critical, that you have to always have this, you know, uh, moment uh, of, of, of uh, epiphanies is, is the word that comes to mind. And... Uh, yeah, it's such a different world, I guess. So. I, yeah, it's it's kind of 
we have our own separate courses in 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 schools these days for simply the art of networking and and building networks and and how you present your ideas like we can have courses for pitch meetings of all goddamn things right yeah that's one way of connecting and making contacts here is henrik to go to our instagram page and make some videos of you singing in the shower or Whatever you have going on in your daily life, and that—that that is precisely why why I constantly I'm abusing the fa- uh, uh, the, the podcast Facebook page and trying to make it the dissonant wasteland it currently is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already doing that enough, but do you think the humility of Malas, if you will, is maybe stemming from his surrounding culture, or do you think Malas is just a kind of a personality of his own in a sense that well of course I'm generalizing here um, very much very I much, think but. it's it's having to have been having to have suffered a lot um, and I think many directors in the Arab world and have had their projects stolen have lost money have lost time because of corruption um, because of lack of money, because of, 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 of a new system right now, many directors, you know, if it's not supported by a couple of funds in Europe, then they can't make their film because there are no funding agencies as much in the Arab world as much. And so it's, it, it's everyone competing for certain funds in Europe. Uh, and they're great funds. They've helped out directors, but that's not how you create cinema by relay it's not europe and it's nothing against europe but it's it's also creates so much competition and i think um he's in a world it's been extremely difficult for him um and but that's what i guess one of the big points of my film and the book is that that the world was seeing syria as a victim as refugees who were helpless and having pity, basically. Hmm. And I think that people like Malas and many writers, and it's not just Syria, it, it's many places, it's the poor also in the world, are not victims. Many of them are not victims. They, they continue, they create, they do, and we need to look at them with this dignity. And I purposely in my film, for example, did not have him, I did not want him to speak about the Arab Spring too much. Right. I didn't, you know, many people have criticized my film because I didn't really focus and be so anti the government. But I really felt that would have been a betrayal to who he was in, on some level because he was not a victim of his circumstances, actually. Um, he always was trying to create a film. And wow, when you look at it, he created over 10 films, all of them quite unique. Yes, we can discuss as academics and critics certain repetitions, but in the end, when you look at the diversity of his films, it's quite amazing. Also, the different styles, the different places within Syria itself. And I think in that sense, repeating that phrase that he is not a victim of a map um, and that Syria, there's so much more to Syria than the civil war, the metaphor of the civil war. And I think Mm. Um, it's important always when we have these catastrophes to to not to not give in to the metaphor of oh those poor people that there's something more. Um, I think even for the Holocaust, when we look at some mm. of the films on the Holocaust, it depends. You know, when you look at the Pianist or when you look at other ones, and you see that that there was some strength that came out of of the ghettos or this or that. Um, it, it's it's quite important. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yes, it is. It yeah. There's always. It's not always about what what you see in the media. This this blanket vision that okay, it's now war in Syria. For example, one good example, I guess, that I could throw right now is that, for example, my sister was living in Greece, and we would get all this news all the time that you know no, there's. There's demonstrations all over Greece, and uh, everything is just about demonstrations. But then he see, she sees those news from the, the from the from the Finnish governmental uh, uh, TV, and then he, she goes goes outside and 
doesn't see any protesters at all. So there's always so, so many pockets where different things are happening. And uh, as I understand, at least in 2019, Syria was partly open to the tourists as well and zones where people yes, could actually well, go. Yeah, it's controversial still. It's still a, a, right. a nightmare, right. I think, Syria um, in terms of the poverty. I mean, I think when you look at the Arab world, Syria and Yemen are two places that uh, really... Uh, you know, uh, it's just tragedies and stuff like that. Uh, and it's tragedies that uh, no one's really looking at either. Um, but but the people themselves and how we look at them and how, um, yeah, maybe it can change. Maybe, I mean, my idea is always, what I tell students is that, you know, uh, you know I'm, there, there are many issues in my part of the world with the country of Iran, the nation state of Iran. But Iranian cinema, when studied in depth, um, shows you nuances, nuances that are so important. And maybe you don't understand everything, and maybe you don't agree with certain things, um, but, you, but it's so important to watch and watch with an intensity. And I mean, I think this is for, you know, for, for almost every, every culture and every issue. Um, so. Yeah, there's something about cinema that makes the world accessible in an easy way you know, right. once you once you see some films from from a certain region it's easier to you know get to the, the background topic like what was this and, history that they were discussing yeah to talk about what you don't like i mean when you show chris marker to a conservative audience sans soleil and you have the phallic symbols of of of, of animals um they're, they're, and it's uh, it can be quite a, uh, offensive but why is it offensive to you why wasn't it what was he trying to say about Japanese culture and himself? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's finding these moments in cinema sometimes that people don't understand and, and discussing them that is, is, is inspiring for me as, a, you know, as someone who tries to teach cinema, right? What, what resonates with you the most about Mohamed Malas cinema? The, I'll go back to what I said in the beginning. It's, it's poetic form its ability to create a sense of the sacred in his ambiance, in his ability to, I'll use Henrik's word, to immortalize humans and their struggles, um, very much connected to his own struggle. Um, and, you know, I'm going to his two most famous films, Dreams of the City and the Night, but I would say he continues this in, in all of his films. And so it's really a, a, a poetic cinema that that resonates with me it's the ability to see cinema as poetry and cinema as yeah as a language in and of itself that he continuously works with and henrik fire up the adjectives first please how would you describe this film in adjective one or more these films my my adjective for for malas's films would be sad because that's Kind of, even, even though they are not necessarily sad movies on on their own, or, or these are these are these are not like like tragic movies necessarily, but there is, in in my opinion, the the one kind of the the one emotion that carries through all of them is 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 a certain type of a certain type of esoteric sadness that. In my opinion, co comes from th from the fact that Malas is is dealing with with his own memories and and with his own past as he makes these movies, and he's kind of constantly facing that in in some form or the other. I had a, I had a <clears throat> interesting time going through all the history around these films and uh, all the words and how how little you feel yourself as when you realize that there is like a whole wide world they're waiting for you in in sense of cinema or or history or culture that you could deep dive into but for me i guess this is not properly valid after our, our discussions of dreamy and mem memory but for me these are definitely at times dreamy films i don't know what the adjective would be that from memory like <laughs> yeah, no, I think dr dr dreamy memory are those are and, and and also Henrik, what you said, there is this there is this sadness of of 
of, of uh, memory and the psyche of, of damage and personal trauma, a film of personal trauma that, that comes out. And, you know, Malas was influenced by, by filmmakers like Tarkovsky's Mirrors, Bergman's Wild Strawberries, Kurosawa's Barbarossa, and, and all these directors wanted to look at their interior worlds in a subjective vision. And he, he himself, you know, it's this subject, you know, the, the film act is subjectivity, but in the end, it's a personal sadness, a personal memory, and a personal dreaminess, perhaps, too. And so, again, it's, and it's the big question, how do you film the personal without being too narcissistic? And how do you film the personal so that it connects to other people? Um, and I, I think on some level, his personal, his very personal films, the first ones, and even passion on, on some level, in the end did connect to the world. Maybe not everyone, but they were able to connect. Um, and and it, that, that's, that's pretty important. Um, would there be any adjective that you would use in this art to, to describe Malas's films? Well, I mean, I think... <laughs> You're asking me, I have too many adjectives I used some already. <laughs> I already gave a lot of them and I used some of the ones that you used. Um, um, but I would like I would stick to the word poetic. Let's just stick to that one. If you want if you want to pin put me in a corner, um, I, I, I will use the word um, poetic um, as the one adjective. Um, but you know, subjectivity, interior, interiorizing, also, uh, in, um, uh, you know, I would even maybe be more extreme than Henrik and take his adjective and instead of calling it sad, I call it a cinema of trauma, actually. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm always playing with these terms myself. So. These are part of the questions that we always ask at the end of every episode so don't be alarmed of the the forming of this this question but I, I mean, these questions always lead to more thinking so it's great thank you yeah so Henrik would you consider to watch these films ever again <laughs> <laughs> well that, that, that's a good good <laughs> good time to say no I hated them all <laughs> but yeah yeah, I I do see myself checking these movies a second time, most likely also a third and fifth time. Uh, once again, not not necessarily any time too soon. Like I'm I'm not gonna rewatch them immediately after we close this session tonight, but they. That they are films that I I do think that they demand a hell of a lot from you, like especially yeah. his his early films, yeah. which are very very much tied into a place and tied into a culture and tied into certain people. Like for example, the the night you you really have to to do your homework and and take the effort to to study the history so that you can even understand what are the events and what are the people that that these characters are talking about and what exactly is happening and and why is the the, the dad or leaving to Palestine for a second time mm. you that, that's not something that is immediately clear at, at least to me as a as a as a westerner and that that's something that I I do think that we in the West, that the Western audiences kind kind of have to take the time and have to they make the effort to to study the backgrounds the the real life real history backgrounds behind what is said in 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 individual piece of dialogue, but I I do think that they once you make that job they they are important enough that. It, they most definitely do merit uh, a recurring viewing, and they are also cinematographers. They they are quite artistic, and they do take make decisions and choices artistically that are not that often seen in cinema. Yeah, these are films that require effort from the from the watcher, and 
course, that is not taking anything away from the from the films. So once you get to understand these films on a certain level, that, that well, these require a certain mindset to dig into. But once you're there, I think you will enjoy it, and you need a lot. I mean, a lot of historical context. So this way you can fully enjoy these films, uh, apart from passion, perhaps, which is more accessible, as we have stated. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're right. I think there, there is some, like when you look at the night, there, there needs to understand um, 1936 and the war and how Palestine was becoming an issue. Um, and, I, and I mean, really, a, a big issue we haven't talked about is Palestine in Malaz's films. And even if you don't know the history um, that well, you see how it was such an important part of people's memory of remembering the war to Palestine, of how many young men, like they, just like many young men all over the world went to Spain to fight in the Civil War, many young men like Molesse's father, like my grandfather, um, all went to fight in Palestine, believing in a cause um, to fight against the British or to fight against what they thought was like Zionist imperialism, so on and so forth. Um, and you can sense the emotions of these issues in people. You might not know them. You, they might be strange, but I, I don't know. What is the best way to study history? Is it, uh, some people might say it's better to recreate certain emotions of a time. I had a history professor that wanted to make films on the French Revolution that were not so much about explaining the guillotine, but the actual emotion of fear um, that it created um, without really getting into the details of Danton or Robespierre and all those important historical figures. So I think it's also a big question when watching his films of what we want out of history. But I think you guys are right to watch them. He, he made these films in the end. He, 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 like he made them for his own people, for people that were quite familiar with these issues. And I think that's what's great about watching them because you're not watching a film that was made for you. Um, and that's, for me, we, we can learn a lot more from that. Sorry, my dog is uh, going crazy <laughs> in the house. Maybe he, maybe he wants to watch a Malas film too. Anyway. <laughs> All right, well, here we come to the finishing line. Henrik, would you recommend the Mohammed Malas films that we have seen for this episode? Uh, I, I do recommend them, e even with, with the caveat that I gave in the previous question that, that ye, these, these do require you to do, do homework and, and to study, study the subject matter outside of the movies as as Nizar pointed out, these are not movies that are necessarily made for you and me. A at least not directly. Like these are films that we can watch and that we can approach once we actually w finally do do some work our ourselves and try to somehow cross that bridge. The, the, uh, and the the bridge is not there for us, uh, like ready made, but. I, I do think that that the films do merit to be seen. Yeah, especially I... and and most of all because the the kind of the, kind of the, the larger theme or, or or the main thing in these movies is the humanity of them. That the fact how they they look at people people and cultures that well, as pointed out, we in the West, we easily have just, just a couple of stereotypes, and that's exactly how we see the Islamic world. That's how we see Arab, Arab world. To us, it's 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 like, it, it's just words, like Islam, honor killings. It's it's a few tropes, and that's how, how we perceive those cultures. And what, ma what these films do, they do remind you of the people behind behind those image be, behind that that Western perceived image of what the Arab world is, and it, it does they they do remind you that that 
even even behind the 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 the, the news headlines that you have in Finland about Syria today, behind those headlines, there are living, thinking, feeling individuals that are there are people behind the be, be, behind the headlines, and that's perhaps in in this this media storm that we are currently going through. That's a very important lesson to be reminded of. Yeah, we are truly unlocking doors of cinema here, Henrik. Tonight, this is uh, if you make the leap to. Well, first of all, if you find find these films and then then watch them, I think it will be a great gateway to even more adventures in the world of cinema and and even more so during the making of this podcast for these three or so years, they have been great gateways for us understanding history from really sometimes you could say even obscure parts of the world, uh, like some. Of, French islands in the Caribbeans, which are not like exactly the, the hotspot of, of politics or right. media visi- visibility. So the the more you, I guess, understand the um, what happens happens globally, <laughs> kind of everywhere, despite of uh, where the most of the reporting is concentrating on, the better. But that, of course, does kind of, kind of raise up the se- the a follow up question, which is. Well, well, it it ties down to the whole does movie X has a legacy thing? Like, does does well, these films do do they have a legacy? Especially, do they have a legacy? Well, since you and me are are Finnish, can they have a legacy in in Western world? Can they have a legacy in in Finland? Because that's something I I like with with the with the question. Would I recommend them? I absolutely would. But Me too. but if asked, do they have a legacy? I I'm I'm kind of more hesitant. I really don't know. I'm almost kind of veering off to the direction of no, because it as you men like you pointed out, they are extremely hard to come by. Like uh, the, the the versions that that we have been watching for for the podcast, th- these are digitalized archive copies of the movies. Mm. And th- these are not in circulation in in Amazon, on eBay, on 4K Blu-ray discs. And because of that, well, for us in the west, in, in the in the west, they are actually hard hard, hard to even see. So. Them having having a legacy in 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 Western world can be tricky, perhaps even po- Im- impossible. So then it comes the question: How about the legacy in in Arab world, in in the Islamic world, and that that's also kind of well, can they have as as the the cover as as the turmoil, for example, in in Syria is is constantly ongoing, and the infrastructure in Syria has is is all, almost gone. And uh, every now and then, the government tries to to chip in and and ban movies and destroy them from circulation. So it, it's kind of I I would almost make the case that that Malas might be a director in in need and deserving of of preservation, es, especially in in the Western world. Mm-hmm. But we you. <sighs> In in the past, this this podcast has made the offer for some obscure directors whose films we have felt are of such quality that they they would deserve some I, I don't know quote unquote muscle from our end to try to push them to, to be seen in for example in Finland or or other other con- Western countries and I think that Mars would be a director who who would actually need a similar type of offer like i would i would happily help malas's films to be seen in in finnish film festivals yeah or have absolutely. have a dvd the goal for my film was was achieved in a couple of places like in doc lisboa one of the great documentary film festivals of, of the doc alliance 
it showed my film along with Malas documentaries. Um, in in the in one documentary festival in London, it also showed. So, I mean, on some level, there has been some resurgence of Malas. I know it sounds a little bit not humble, but through through the film that I did on him, and I'm, if I mean, I'm proud. That, that was one of the goals of this film is to, you know, I never expected my film to, uh, you know, to be only on its own. It was always in the end, like w when you make a film, you think ten years, what's it going to be its legacy? And and the legacy of an, of an homage film is that it makes people go back and watch Molesse's film. And so I really hope that, you know, um, I think there is a legacy that filmmakers' legacies are always developing. You know, you have someone in America who wasn't famous, Samuel o. Fuller. He completely has a big legacy on the French New Wave. Um, you never know what, what happens when someone watches different filmmakers. I mean, the, the well-known Palestinian filmmaker Ilya Suleiman he, he was very much influenced by Taiwanese cinema, um, actually. And so I think this issue of legacy is always developing right now because we can push to have more access and distribution. And I think you're right, Enric. It's not just about Malas, but so many filmmakers. And probably filmmakers, many independent filmmakers from all over. But I think especially a country like Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, it there is a desperate a desperate need for preservation. You said it, Enric. That's the that's the word to underline. There there needs to be a lot of preservation, and Malas is one of many. I'd like to underscore. Now, a question which might be a bit of a mood point tonight, but uh, okay, Henrik, in which order would you put these films, if in any? I wouldn't put them in in any order. Yeah, it's just like, like per perhaps. Uh... To, to to give give at at least something to this question uh like what was my per, perhaps the least favorite of, of the movies uh perhaps passion okay. uh I, or on, on a second thought may, perhaps dreams of the city yeah actually Fo followed by passion uh i i can't rank any any of the the, the rest of them though like, like that's the best I can give to you. I don't have a favorite, and I can't put them on any kind of top five, top three lineup. I can't explain to you either of how or why I would put them in the order that I would put them. But um, maybe it's the cinematography, and the maybe this is the some of the purest Muhammad Malas that you can get, if you will, the night from nineteen ninety two. Where you where you get the his history, you get maybe more sophisticated camera work and uh, really his love for his um, hometown and that kind of the, the memory or the dreamy vibes really are very memorable to me in this film. I did I did like Passion. Um, I did like Quinetra seventy four. For some reason, Dreams of the City is the one that I left as the last one, and I, I cannot give you an uh, argumentation for it, particularly. Maybe it's um, that there is maybe the least focus on characters. Uh, perhaps, yeah. Dreams of the City was a lot of... was, in many ways, it was a movie that, that mainly was focusing on the world that happened around the characters, and the characters never like, like the main character did never really like made an an he never made a conscious comment on kind of what was happening on on political level around him he he wasn't a political commenta commentator he he wasn't some someone who took politically actively part in the in the proceedings like for example the dad in in the night who who twice goes to fight in order to to liberate Palestine and he, and that perhaps could explain why there there is not that feeling of a strong central character in in the dreams of the city is there <clears throat> uh, does Nizar want to take part of 
of this sorting of the films discussion. Uh, that's extremely putting me in the corner there, guys. But <laughs> I mean, let me just argue against you guys just for fun. Um, I would put Dreams of the City up there. It, it, it has a sort of musicality to it. And when I, I, I was able to see it on a big screen um, in Syria when I was living there, I, I think it was a film of many historical moments through the anger of a young boy. And when I think about Dreams of the City, my memory is an emotional memory of a young boy who is knocking his head against the door because his, because his mother had to live in abject poverty um, and she had to marry someone who abused her. And this is Malus's story. Mm. Um, also, Malus, like Deeb, had to work in a laundry. And I, I showed an image of that in my film, um, him ironing as a young man um, in Damascus. He had to work his way through school and stuff like that. Um, so Dreams of the City, I mean, I'm not going to say it's my favorite film or it's the number one. Um, it is the number one film in the Arab world that made him, you know, that showed in Khan. But, you know, I think what's the best film and what how things change changes for us. I mean, for me, I, I, I actually do really love Melissa's documentaries. I think they were done with amazing compassion, amazing dedication and ethics that are part of the documentary cinema, creative cinema. Um, but... Um, you know, uh, I, 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 it's hard to rank them that way. Yeah. The Arab world definitely ranks Dreams of the City as the number one Malas film and has the most screenings of any of his films and probably one of the most popular ones screening in like Arab film festivals. Um, it just screened two years ago in Tunisia, actually. Um, but... It's interesting that you guys mention that being the one that you would put on the bottom, I think, or not number, mm. um, because there is something that's um, uh, that there is the narrative of it is sort of circular, elliptical. It doesn't exactly like um, it ends. It, it sort of ends in a moment of history, and Deeb is just this observer to the failure of. Uh, of, of a certain period. And I, I think it's hard to access everything. But for Malas, I mean, for him, it's this vision of time, a personal vision that he wanted to show what it was like growing up in Damascus as a poor person. And he also wanted to show um, how politics was part of daily life at the time. And he felt that this the daily life of political argument and debates and people getting angry and people having hopes and dreams, he feels that's over. And that's why he still loves Dreams of the City. That's why he, he himself still feels it's his best film because it represents a, a, a society that he feels never was able to come back. Um, and just like that person falls off the bicycle, there's a powerful scene of someone falling off a bicycle in Dreams of the City. I mean, he sees that as the Syrian state itself. Yeah. And the next question, it would probably totally feel like a ambush. So I'm not asking you to participate in it if you don't want to. But Henrik, uh, complete the sentence, please. You really know you're watching Muhammad Malas films when? When you hear the director himself state, I, I wish my, uh, stopping my work in cinema would end my pain, so I could get some rest for once. Which actually also ties in back back to the whole whole legacy question. Uh, that's a statement that Malas made in your documentary, right? At at the very end, and true that that statement was followed by by by, by the closing shot where. Malas is asking from someone in, in the film crew, did you lose your memory? And that someone who we do not see answers, yes, I lost it. I forgot everything. And kind of what, 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 
as a, as a kind of final question, I would like to ask, what is your take on on that statement and and on on that final shot? Like, is is Mala someone who wishes to be forgotten at the end? Because that's kind of what what the the feeling that I got when Mala makes the notion that he he wishes that to stop with cinema and he wishes that 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 would end his pain like that does just malas himself that does he want to become forgotten at the end as a director i i don't know if he wants to become forgotten but he wants i mean he said that in an extreme emotional state that you know i wish that i i wouldn't have this much pain and then i wouldn't have to do cinema but this is the human condition and so i make cinema to express myself, to express who, who I am. And um, the ending of the film is part of the film style that I created, which was breaking the fourth wall, which was showing that this is a film being made about a film. People, some people in some cinema audiences were saying, this, uh, you made a mistake, you showed the this. Well, yes, I, I, I purposely showed that you know, I showed the outtakes with as part of the film, and that was something always part of the process. The ending has annoyed people. They felt it should have been stronger. But I wanted to end it at a, in a jovial way. And, um, and with the question, I mean, you got it perfect, Henrik, what the intent was, is that what's the relationship between memory and forgetting? We, in order to have memory, we need to forget a little bit and then remember. Right, because it's 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 a give and take, mm. um, and in history, sometimes too much memory is dangerous. Um, you can see the Balkans. Some Serbians from some towns, their their memory is too much, so that they that if they see any other person, they want to kill. I mean, so you know, it's this play that we have between memory and forgetfulness that allows us humans to survive. We need to forget a little bit, and then we need to remember something. But what and when is such an interesting question. And certain societies force memories on their people, or force, absolutely, like the absolutely. French forced forgetfulness on their people when it came to the drowning of the 200 people that you see in Haneke's film, that was sort of mentioned in Cachet, um, in, in the Austrian filmmaker. And so I think that's sort of the, the big legacy of Malas is, is this interplay between memory and forgetfulness also. Yeah, too much memory. What does it mean to have too much memory? And I think, uh, what does it mean to forget everything? Um, is it possible? Um, and so the, the question that came up in the interview was exactly that, but I didn't, I mean, I, I had over, you know, 18 hours of interview footage with Malas. I, I obviously couldn't mm. include everything in the film. Yeah, and it was supposed to be much longer, but then you even shortened it up further yeah it was supposed to be it was supposed to be a 90 minute film but i think uh i made the film for global audiences i made the film for people that never knew about molas um i made it shorter i made it i tried to make it enjoyable or quicker um because i wanted the younger generations to want to want to experience it a little bit i i did um you know, I, I did consciously make a quicker film, quicker paced film than even I wanted. Um, so. so a hashtag released a Nizar cut. <laughs> uh, so there's a Nizar cut. Yeah, but the Nizar cut really, I believe in the cut that I have now because it, it, in the end, the, the 90 minute cut would be more, it is really for people who, um, want to just see more of Malas and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's like the extra outtakes that you'd put on a, a Criterion DVD or something like that. Um, I have them all and hopefully one day I'll put it all on a website because it is all very archival, all the footage that I have. Is there anything that you would like to bring forth? Is there some works of yours that could be watched online or anywhere else? Or what, what are your future projects? Um, I'd just like to say that I have a future project on, um, which is a hybrid documentary. It's, it's, it's not an homage. It's called The Guilt Project. I'm working on the script this summer. 
It's a uh, hybrid. It's going to have embedded documentary in it, and it's all about um, it's all about guilt, but it's based on one personal story that I'm connecting to the world. Um, and um, it's quite ambitious for me, and it's not, uh, I'm afraid of it, but at the same time, I've gotten some encouragement, I've gotten some funds to, to work on it, and I hope, you know, within two years, it can become a reality. I, I know it's going to take that long, because uh, when you do things on your own, you, um, yeah, you need to be patient. Um, and the other thing I'd like to lastly say is thank you, um, Carrie and Henrik, for being um, rigorous, for being astute, for really caring about this podcast and all the podcasts that you obviously do. Um, it um, I, It's way more important than you guys imagine. It really, it pushes someone like me um, to to work more, to care more, and I think, uh, yeah, a big, big, big uh, thank you to both of you. Lots of gratitude for your work, and not just for your work, but the way you guys do this. Um, I'm, I'm, I've done over 20 to 30 interviews about Malas, and you guys are just amazing, and you should be proud of yourselves for really do, doing a lot of work. To, to, to make this um, an in-depth type of interview. It's not, it's definitely not easy to do that. Um, so thank you guys. Really big thank you. That must be the most heartwarming yeah. response we have ever gotten. Th- this, this must be, this really made, made my evening here. So the book, The Cinema of Muhammad Malas, uh, can be found, for example, on Amazon as a Kindle release and also as an actual book, we would like to thank also Irit Nightheart for from Mac Films. What is waiting for us next week, Henrik? Well, before we get to that, uh, also a quick summary, since, uh, a quick note as as Malas and his work also came up, and how you can uh, what what from Malas you can actually get on your hands. His book concert that he made as a as a companion piece to the the documentary film The Dream. There are a few copies that you can find from eBay. They are perhaps a, a little bit pricey comparing that it's an old used book, but still relatively cheap cheap reading for you. So if if that's if, if it sounds interesting Please go and, you know, get yourself self a copy. All right. So just to give you a heads up, dear listeners, uh, after the next episode in two weeks, we will take a little break, the summer break of this podcast that we traditionally have been taking. And uh, we will give you the dates closer to the event. So this will be about a month of a break for us. And as a bit of a teaser for our listeners, in two weeks we will look at the production of Lee Song Hee Il, a South Korean director known for a few uh, short films and uh, feature films as we are approaching the LGBT summer days. We would like to raise this director to the pedestal with films No Regret, Night Flight, White Night, Suddenly Last Summer, and going south. You can find us on theflicklab.com and social medias, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your comments and uh, thank you for coming to our little podcast too. Okay, I will be I will be in touch and uh, I, ho- I, I still hope to meet you guys, Henrik and Kari. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take care of yourselves. Thank you. Wish you yeah. guys well. Wish you guys you well. Too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.